Hello students of statics, this is Dr. Dan Baker. In today's lecture, we're gonna focus on the area products of inertia. Okay, we've talked about area moments of inertia, and this is a closely related topic. The products of inertia come into play when we have asymmetrical cross sections. Okay, so if we take a look at a piece of angle iron, and angle iron is essentially shaped like an L, Okay, so once again, this is the cross section looking across the middle. So if we looked at a beam, I'm gonna make it a little skinnier as I draw the beam. There's that top part, here's the bottom leg. And let's say that we have this supported at the ends. And let's just throw a uniformly distributed load across the top. Okay, so once again, this is the um, cross section view and this is the side view. So that distributed load is basically going in and out of the page on the cross-section view, um, something like that, okay? So what happens when we load a asymmetrical, so a non-symmetrical cross-section, is that this beam will do two things. One of the things that the beam will do, of course, is to deflect, and that deflection would look something like this. Right. This would be if it was a really flexible beam or if the load is really high and the beam is quite elastic. But we know with a symmetrical beam, that's all it's going to do. Basically, it's going to um, flex in the plane of the load. Okay, but what we also see with a um, asymmetrical beam is that not only does it deflect like I'm showing over here on the right, but it's also going to twist. Okay, and that twisting would look something like this okay so this is like what the middle of that cross-sectional beam would look like say right here call this section a call this view a it's often doing drafting and so you're gonna have some twist as well as bend okay and so you kind of have a, a more complex um, reaction or deformation based upon the loading okay and this twist is related to this product of inertia, which we're going to use, it's still going to be I, but now it's going to be X, Y, okay? Instead of X or Y alone, it is going to be I, X, Y is a product of inertia. So this is related to I, X, Y. And so it turns out that the moments of inertia, um, they're not just about the principal axes, okay? We could actually write in matrix form what we call the inertia tensor. And this inertia tensor is a three by three matrix consisting of here is my I X X, noting that we often take the shorthand calling this I X X simply I X. And then across the diagonal here, we have I, Y, Y, and then I, Z, Z. But then we have all the other combinations as well. So we have I, X, Y, I, X, Z, I, Y, X, I, Y, Z, I, Z, X, and I, Z, Y. Okay, so nine different um, combinations. And again, along this diagonal here, these are like your principal axes. So these are the typical ones we dealt with previous in the chapter. I know we didn't do three dimensional ones, so we didn't get an IZZ, but these are the IXX. I'm gonna go ahead and label here. This guy, of course, is IY. And so we are going to focus now on this one, we'll, and we'll stick in two dimensions just to this one product of inertia from the inertia tensor I, X, Y. Okay, so in integral form, it turns out that I, X, Y is equal to, do, using a single integral, we can say the single integral of now X times Y dA. Okay, so instead of X squared or Y squared, we now have just the distance, X and Y, DA. Now, if we go ahead and write the parallel axis theorem form of the product of inertia um, equation, that is going to be that I, X, Y is equal to, 
And we're going to go do this for composite bodies, right? So the sum of, including all the different bodies uh, making up a system. And so we have our product of inertia about the centroid plus our parallel axis theorem piece, which is the area of each part times the distance to the centroid of each element in the x-direction and the distance to the centroid of each element or each part in the y-direction. Okay, so again, instead of an x squared, y squared, we're just simply multiplying x times y. Now, one of the things that's pretty cool, or pretty convenient, I guess, about this equation is that quite often this i bar x, y is zero. And it turns out that our i bar x, y is equal to zero when a body is symmetrical about the centroidal x or y axis. Okay, let's look at a series of shapes. So let's go with a square or a rectangle. How about an I-beam? And a triangle. Doesn't have to be equilateral, just a triangle. Does have to be isosceles um, and centered around this axis here. And we can have a pipe. Right, so these are all cross-sectional views. So I've got two clusters here, and here's my other cluster. How about a triangle that's a right triangle here? Uh, maybe a quarter circle. Uh, C channel. And angle iron. So two clusters, four on each side. Take a look at these and see if you can decide which cluster is essentially symmetrical about either the x or y axes and which is not. So hopefully you quickly see that over here on the left, these are symmetrical about, and let me go ahead and put the axes on here, or excuse me, the centroid. Centroid here, centroid here, centroid down here, centroid in the middle, right? So we're talking about um, symmetrical about either of these axes through the centroid. Now some of these are symmetrical about both, and that's double bonus, but it only needs to be symmetrical about one, just like the triangle here. And so in this case, our i bar, x, y, are going to equal zero for all of those shapes. And over here, the i bar, x, y, is going to be not equal to zero. Okay, so let's go ahead and test this a little further. Let me draw a couple shapes and we'll also think about their distance to um, the given axes from the centroid object um, to the given axes. Okay, so here is an axis system. And we'll go X horizontal, Y on the vertical. Here are three shapes. Let's go with a right triangle up here call this shape number one. Let's go with a equilateral triangle over here in the first quadrant, call that number two. And we'll go with a rectangle centered there on the x-axis, number three. Okay, and so what I'd like you to go ahead and do, I'm gonna set up a table here and then you can pause the video and fill it in, is for each of these shapes, one, two, and three. I would like you to list out what the sign is. Okay, so we're going to fill this table in with either plus, minus, or zero. And so we want to look at the sign of the x bar EL, the y bar EL, the area, the um, product of those three, the area times x bar EL, um, y bar, E, L, and then finally the I bar, X, Y. So we can see all those, that's good. Okay, so let me go ahead and draw some lines here, I'm creating a grid.
And so go ahead and pause the video, fill in this table with positives, negatives, or zeros, and then restart the video. Welcome back from that. Um, noting here that our centroids, I'm gonna go and sketch these on. There's a centroid of two, centroid of three sits right on the x-axis, centroid of one, one third of the base and height from the right triangle corner. Okay, so there's those three points. And so measuring from my y-axis over to the centroid at one will give me a negative value. Okay, so this will be a negative. It will also be negative x bar el for three. Let's go ahead and fill that one in since I saw that one. And then horizontally over to the centroid of two will be positive. Okay, so first column there, negative, positive, negative. Now looking at the vertical distance from basically the x-axis to each centroid. For shape one, this will be positive. For shape two, also positive from the x-axis up to the centroid here of two. Now the centroid of three sits right on the x-axis. So it turns out it has a zero y bar el. Now there's no holes in this drawing. These are all positive shapes. And so given all positive shapes, we're gonna have positive areas. If there's any holes in the shape, those would be negative, but these would be three positives. And then simply taking the product of these three, you can think of them as just you know, negative one, positive one, positive one, which of course a negative times two positives is going to give me a negative. So this will be a negative. Um, three positives give me a positive and then a negative and a zero. Anything times zero gives you a zero. Okay, so that will be the parallel axis theorem addition pieces. And then for the last term here, we're just looking at the symmetry. Okay, so shape one, um, has a non-symmetrical cross-section. Keep in mind that it has to be symmetric about either of these two axes, horizontal and vertical, basically lining up with the axis system in the problem. And so this is going to be a positive value. But the other two shapes, um, triangle is symmetrical about the vertical axes and the rectangle is symmetrical about both the horizontal and vertical. So both of these will be zero. So zero and zero. Okay, and of course, if there's numbers involved, which there are going to be in a lot of problems, you just go ahead and insert those numbers um, to compute the overall values. And then you just add them up. Again, if we were trying to find the overall um, product of inertia, which these three bodies aren't really connected, so it may not make sense to do that. This would be more kind of computing these each independently. But noting if you're doing that independently, you just add together these two values. Right, you add together whatever your i bar x y is to your parallel axis theorem shift, your a x bar e l times y bar e l, and that would give you your product of inertia about the given axes. So that's all there really is to products of inertia, very similar steps to moments of inertia, just the slight wrinkle that um, most products of inertia about the centroid, if it has any kind of symmetry, either horizontal or vertical, go to zero. Um, we have our um, parallel axis theorem equation here where we can shift that moment of inertia about other axes that are not the centroid. And again, the reason that we're doing all of this is we're interested often if we have a non-symmetrical cross-section, how that shape deforms under bending. Okay, and so um, here not only is this beam going to smile, but it's also going to twist. Okay, and the twist here is going to be related to this product of inertia. Thank you for listening today and I hope you're having a good one.